the deal is I'm giving you, I'm giving you both sides. I'm going to give it to you straight down the middle because that's what we do. That's what I do. That's my job. I'm not trying to pick fights with the president, and, and a lot of journalists are. I'm not trying to get on Stephen Colbert's show because I'm, you know, I'm an anti-Trump journalist. I'm just trying to cover the news. Those things where as a journalist you think, come on, you can't do that. You can't do that. You just have to say, we don't know enough right now. We're learning, we're getting, here's what we do know. And here's what, what experts on both sides are saying about it. We don't know enough to draw conclusions. You can't just start with a conclusion and then hope to fill in the facts. Columbine, 9-11, those are, those are really world-altering stories because it changes, you know, the, the, it just takes a little bit of the innocence away from that the country had before then. Journalists now need to take a step back and just back out of the whole activist thing and just start calling balls and strikes. Welcome to this week's episode of American Real. This week, we bring you Fox News reporter and anchor, Trace Gallagher. Trace was one of the original employees joining Fox News back in October of 1996. Since then, he's covered some of the major news stories in our nation and around the world. Everything from hurricanes to Columbine to Trayvon Martin and 9-11. The youngest of five, Trace talks about how he comes from a family of storytellers and how that actually helped him breaking into the news world. In addition, we talked about Trace's friend, Colin the Herd Cowherd, and how their similar paths took them to many of the same cities around the country. Colin introduced Trace to his wife and actually claims that he is responsible for their first child. Our guest talks about today's political scene the responsibility of a journalist not being an activist, comparing their job to being an umpire calling balls and strikes. And now, without further ado, I bring to you Mr. Trace Gallagher. This is American Real. I am Roger Brooks. My guest today is Trace Gallagher, a reporter and anchor for Fox News. You have dedicated your career to journalism, where you've worked in many great cities around the country, such as Chicago, San Francisco, New York, and Las Vegas, to name a few. Mm -hmm. You have covered and delivered some of the major news stories in our country throughout your career, which we'll discuss and much more. Trace, welcome to the show. Good to be here, Roger. Thank you for having me. Oh, I really appreciate it. We have a mutual friend. Glenn, yes. who put us in contact, and I know you guys go way back in, in Las Vegas. We go back to the Vegas days, and Glennie was, you know, he was a friend of Colin's, and Colin Cowherd has now become a very well-known sportscaster, opinion guy, radio guy, and Glennie and Colin were very close, and I met Colin because we worked at the same station in Las Vegas, the NBC affiliate, and Colin was the sports guy there, and I was the new news guy, and so... Uh, Colin, I walked into his office one time because I had just come from Boise, Idaho, which was my second job in television. Boise, Idaho to Las Vegas, and in Boise, I think I was making like 16,000 bucks a year, and my salary in Vegas, I think, was like 25, so I was wealthy. So I got down there, but I didn't really have any suits. And so I, I was anchoring, they said, hey, can you anchor the news tonight? Because the, the main anchor is off. So I walked into Colin's office and I said, I need a jacket. I don't have a jacket. 
And he said, you don't have a jacket. So Colin gave me a jacket, and, and he's taller than I am. His arms are longer, right. so the jacket was too long. <laughs> but I went out there, and I anchored it. And, you know, until I actually got a couple of paychecks in so I can go out and buy a couple of suits, I would borrow Colin's jacket to anchor. We became friends. And Glennie was kind of part of Colin's team. You know, Colin was one of his, one of his gang members. Yeah. And so Glennie and I would hang out a lot. And over the years, you know, we became very close. And he's just, you know, he's just a sweetheart of a man. Yeah, he sure really. is. He sure is. And he'll do anything for anyone. He's one of those type of guys. Yeah. And, but thinking back to those days, Trace, when, when you had to borrow the jacket, yeah. weren't those the best of times? They really were. I mean, we were, uh, you know, we were young. Colin was really popular already in Las Vegas because he had been there for about probably three years. He started off and he was doing some minor league baseball broadcasting. And then he started doing sports at KVBC. And he was popular because remember, I mean, this is the time when when Jerry Tarkanian was at UNLV. That's right. Right. And then the run rebels won the right. national championship. The shark. So it was such a big, big time yes. in Las Vegas sports history. And Colin was kind of following that. And then there was the whole scandal involving UNLV. So that was a big part of the deal. Andre Agassi was the number one player in the world in tennis at that time. And he lived in Las Vegas. So Vegas was a hot sports market. Great so Colin, time to be there. Yeah, it was a great time to be there. And I laugh, I tell the story because Colin was dating a girl, and I say, you know, Colin Cowherd introduced me to my wife. He did, and, and he said to me, he said, look, he said, my girlfriend's got this friend she works with, and let's go out Saturday night. So I said, let's go out Saturday night, fine. So this girl, he calls, and he says, we're all going out Saturday night, double date, we'll go to the UNLV game, we'll go to dinner afterwards, and then whatever. So, okay, it was going to be great. So the girl that he says he's hooking me up with, my now wife, sees me on TV the night before the date and tries to cancel it. <laughs> no kidding. Doesn't like the way I look. <laughs> Were you wearing the jacket that was too long? I was wearing the jacket that was too long. <laughs> Didn't like the way I looked, and she tries to cancel the date. And this is before cell phones, right? This is in sure. the early 90s. She doesn't have a cell phone. Nobody has a cell phone. She can't get a hold of her friend to cancel the date, so she's got to go. Right? She's stuck. She calls her mom and she says, I don't want to go on this date. It's going to be miserable. This guy, I just don't like the way he looks. I just don't like anything about him. And he was on TV and he's just not my style. And his, her mom says, just go. You're not going to marry the guy. Who cares, right? Go. So she went and we moved in together a week later. That's we moved across country together three months later. Wow. And then we got married about a year later. We've been married now for 25 years. That's so awesome. And as you say that, I get the goosebumps because it's somewhat similar to my situation. Really? Timing and everything. We got married in 95, and I've talked to Glenn a little bit about your situation, and um, it's just wonderful, isn't it, to, when you know that person yeah. right away. You say you moved in right away, and right. my wife and I were the same, and, and it's just, isn't it great that those things are possible? And, and I think it's destiny. Yeah, and it's a commitment for her because, you know, when she told her parents, three or four months after meeting me that she was moving to Orlando, Florida with me. They're like, you it's know, you're deal. 23 years old. You're not moving across country with some guy you just met. So we did it. We moved across country and they were not happy at all. But we got married and, you know, we've been moving a lot since then. We moved from, as you were saying in the intro, we moved from Vegas to Orlando. We moved from Orlando to Chicago, Chicago to San Francisco, San Francisco to Los Angeles, LA to New York, New York back to Los Angeles. So we have been moving. The longest we've ever lived in a house was, I think, four and a half years, five years. Okay. That was it. So we've been married for 25 years, and the longest we ever lived in a single house was five years. Wow. That means you're kind of, your turnover is, is high. Sure. Your kids are seeing a lot of different schools and a lot of different friends. It's like being in the military, you know, with with I think better benefits probably but but it really is it's kind of like being in the military so you know she she signed on for the big commitment you know and she knew that well this is going to be an adventure and it has been and that and the funny story is and I was mentioning earlier I said you know Colin Cowherd introduced me to my wife and he actually is the reason my wife got pregnant and people are like what how what? does that happen <laughs> because Colin was married to a woman named Kim and he calls me one day and he says because we had been trying, me and my wife had been trying to get pregnant for a couple of years. And Colin calls me and he says, guess what, Kim is pregnant. I'm like, oh, I'm so happy for you. So he goes, and by the way, it's day 13. The day 13 is when, you know, that's when after your menstrual cycle, day 13 is the day. And my wife looks at me and she goes, it's day 13. A month later, she's pregnant. <laughs> oh my 
gosh, that's awesome. So I say, you know. <laughs> Had he not made that phone right. call. So right. Colin and his wife, Kim, separated, right? They separated. And then when Colin got the job in uh, Connecticut at ESPN, we went to Vegas for his 40th birthday, and he and Kim were getting back together. And they decided on, the, on this night in Vegas, where we all met, that they were getting remarried. So he says, Trace, I, I need a best man. So we drove him through a 24-hour thing, literally like a jack-in-the-box thing, where the woman is leaning out the window, and we pull up, and my daughter's baby seat is in the back, in between Kim and Colin, and we're in front, my wife is there, and Colin and Kim are kind of leaning out the door, and she does the whole wedding right there at the, at the drive-up. Oh, that's... Five minutes, they're married again, boom, back to the casino, we have dinner, it's a great setup. That's priceless. Right? Great story. It's a great story. That is awesome. So... And you guys have remained friends? Yeah, we, you know, we, it was kind of weird, and Colin will tell you the same story, is that when I was in Vegas, Colin was in Vegas, clearly, and then I went to Orlando, and Colin, a couple of months later, got a job in Tampa. Okay, so we're in there, we hang out with Kim and Colin all the time, we're, you know, 90 minutes apart, so we'd go over there for the weekend, he'd come over for the weekend, and then we went to, uh, we ended up in, Sh in San Francisco, Colin was in Portland, Oregon, right? Colin right. goes to Connecticut, we go to Connecticut. We live in Westport, Colin lives in. We come to Los Angeles, Colin comes to Los Angeles. All coincidental. And now we live literally four blocks apart that's, in Manhattan Beach. That's incredible. So, yeah, we have just kind of followed. And I said, I, I just don't tell me you're moving again, Colin, because I don't want to leave. <laughs> that's right. I don't want to go anywhere anymore. <laughs> so, yeah, he's, well, I just saw him for a Super Bowl last week. He had a okay. Super Bowl party, and so we hung out. Great, he's got great. a place in Deer Valley now. And we, uh, we were supposed to be there this weekend, but we couldn't because we had... We had kid events, and, we, and I had this. Okay. And um, so we're going to go up two weeks from now to his place in Deer Valley. Nice. Get a little skiing in. Well, as you know, I'll be interviewing him in a couple of days, right. so it'll be, it'll be good to get his, his yeah. reaction as well to the story. Yeah. So. Very clever, very funny, very talented. You know, and you can, you just, every time, as soon as I met Colin, I'm thinking, this guy's going places because yeah. he's very clever. You know, he's one of those guys who he just kind of gets it. And he, he pulls out the, the irony of any situation, and he's just very clever in the way he phrases things and his opinion and hmm. you know, the, the side of an issue he jumps on is, is fun to watch. Now, do you guys ever talk shop when you're, when you're all together? All the time. Oh, sure. all the time. I mean, and he, it's the same thing. I'll talk sports to him. And he'll talk politics to me. Right. You know, he'll say, oh, this politics is just crazy. And I'll say, yeah, and, you know, I'll give him my political spiel. And then I'll talk sports to him, and he'll give me his, you know, his feeling on this, and I'll give him mine. And I used to say, back in the day, when I would tell Colin a funny story, when he was doing radio in Portland, I'd say, okay, I'm going to tell you this story, but do not use this on the air. Because, you know, Colin will listen to a funny story, and then he'll tell it on the <laughs> sure. air. And you think, Colin, I didn't want you to tell the story. So I'll tell him, I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to do this story, okay? Don't tell it to anybody on the air. Okay. No. And then he does. And then he does. <laughs> Classic. The Classic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. So, look, you're typically on the other side of, of the camera, not right. being interviewed. And, um, but, you know, today, really would love to learn just a little bit about your story, you know, and who you are, what makes you tick, um, some of the characteristics that, that make you unique. Um, and, you know, it's not off. I don't think we typically think about that, mm -hmm. but, you know, I'm curious, what, what, who are you all about? Who is Trace Well, Calvary? I came from a big family. I'm the youngest of five, and we're a big Irish family. And, um, you know, the reason that, that in our family we have very good storytellers is because if you weren't a good storyteller at the dinner table, you didn't get very much time. I mean, you had to be good, and you had to be compelling or somebody else right right would take over so you had to wait till somebody took a, took a drink before you could jump in and tell a story <laughs> or do something because that's that's the way the family was my dad was a great storyteller my mom my sisters and brothers are all very good talkers very good storytellers and so I say you know it, it makes you a good communicator when you have to be clever and good and on and you know at, at the dinner table you're going to be a good communicator in life. So the fact that I was part of a big family was, I think, um, instrumental in making me a better public speaker, you know, somebody who was, who was good off the cuff. And, you know, that's, that's kind of a, it's one of those things where 
you now a lot of kids focus on communication. Schools are just now finding out that, hey, if we teach these kids how to communicate, they're going to be more successful. You know, in the old days, it wasn't about public presentation. Now school, a lot of it is public presentation. They want these kids to be able to, to be confident in, in a public scene and, and speaking and, you know, it gives them so much more confidence and you can just see it. We have these interns that come through now and just in the past 15 years, you know, I've been doing this for 31 years and just in the past 15 years, these interns that are coming through are so much more confident because they focus so much more on public speaking in schools than they ever have. That's great to hear. It really is. But just going back to, so going back to me, these kids from big families, they do these this research study saying the kids from big families are more gregarious. They're yeah. just more outgoing, right? Sure. Then kids from one or two, you know, one or two children families, five or six, seven or eight families, the kids are just more gregarious. Yeah. That's what companies are looking for is kids from big families and stuff. And and there really aren't many big families anymore. You know, that's true. You have three kids now, and they're like, that's a lot of kids. Yeah. Because you got to put these kids in school and so forth. And we have two two children. I think I don't know how I would do five. I don't know how I would do seven. We have friends that have seven. I'm like, how do you do it? Yeah. So you know. So that's, that's part of the background. I, went, I, I grew up in San Diego, Southern California boy, and then I went to high school in Mammoth, and anybody who doesn't know where Mammoth is, it's a ski area in California, and it's up in the Eastern Sierras, and it's one of the biggest ski mountains in the country. Hmm. And my dad decided at some point in time, you know, I was the youngest of five, my siblings were out of high school, and I was in middle school, and he said, uh, let's go to Mammoth. We bought this old youth hostel, a dormitory, no 50 kidding. guys upstairs, 50 girls downstairs, church groups, school groups, and they went up there and we ran the ski lodge for, uh, for five years through high school. Neat. And, and that was kind of my upbringing. So I went from Southern California to the mountains and then I went to college back in Southern California. And I tell people, I said, you know, I kind of got in journalism the back door because I went to the University of San Diego, I played football, I um, <clears throat> studied business, and then I got in journalism because I was a professional water skier. So during college, I was a show skier. Have you ever seen like SeaWorld or Cypress sure. Garden and so forth? So I was the guy that did the pyramid and the front flips and the, and the barefooting and the back barefooting. So you're a daredevil. I did that for, for five years. And at the time, yeah, we would fly kites. I mean, you'd fly the hang gliders up and then you would, you know. That must have been a blast. Down, so. Oh, it was fantastic. I mean, it was, the, it was the greatest job in the world. And my brother-in-law, who was the show director, kind of got me into this. My sister and, and brother-in-law did this. And my brother-in-law was the best, the best show skier in the country at the time. I mean, he's the first guy to ever do a backflip on water skis. He was on the Mike Douglas show. Remember the old Mike sure, Douglas show? So sure. he was on the Mike Douglas show because of that. Wow. And um, so he was, he was very talented, and I was just kind of learning. But I picked, up, you know, I picked up enough that I could do it for five summers, and it was great. But I got hurt. So I got hurt, and they said, there's two choices. You can either be in the pickup boat to pick up all the skis, or you can announce the shows. So I started announcing some of the shows, and I liked it. I was pretty good at it. Okay. And so I did that for a summer, almost a full summer, because I hurt my knee. And I went back to San Diego, and I started announcing fashion shows. You know, anything you could just get up on a mic and sure. start doing. I did fashion shows, fashion auctions. We'd have girls come out in the middle of a bar, and I would auction off the dress they were wearing to the highest bidder. Okay. You'd start it off at 10 bucks, and you'd go up $2 and people would bid. You know, you get these great looking girls and they come out and they're wearing this dress. Sure. And every guy in the bar is like, I want that dress. <laughs> so they bid it up to 50 or 60 bucks. And I did that for a while. And then I kind of, I, you know, I was thinking, this is, this is actually, you know, this is actually enjoyable. So I did that, went back to school, put some, um, put some tapes together and sent them out, and my first job was in Yuma, Arizona. It's actually in El Centro, California, which is part of the Yuma market, okay. which is right on the border of California and Arizona. Okay. So my first job was in Yuma, Arizona, and they offered me this job, and it paid, I think it paid $10,000, $11,000 a year, and I thought, 11000 even in, even in 1987, whatever it was, $10,000, I was like, that's, that's not much money. So, but I took it because you got to take it. It's hard to get in the industry. You know, and at this hard. time, you're single and you're, you're on your own there. Single. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I was dating a girl in, in San Diego, and I was single, and I thought, you know, I just, this, you, have to, you have to do it. There's no, you know, you can't turn down a job. Because I had been looking for a job for like six months, and there's only so many small markets. And there's only so many small markets that are willing to give you a shot sure. to do this. 
So you went in there and I was a one man band. They give you a camera and they give you, they give you the lights and the microphone and you just kind of, you drive around, you look for news and you're the, you're the photographer, the producer, the, the editor and the reporter best all in the one. Best. You know, and you do it for, I think I did that for three months and then they brought me over to Yuma and I was the weekend anchor. And I did that for three months and I was the main anchor. So that's how things move in small markets. And then I was the main anchor for probably three or four more months and then I was out. I went to Boise, Idaho. Things just, you know, sure. because as soon as you get some experience and as soon as you put a tape together, you send Bigger your tape market. out and you get, you know, I, was, I had a job offer in Reno, I had a job offer in Boise, I had a job offer in some Mississippi markets, a small Florida market stuff. And I got to Boise, Idaho and I thought, it's a pretty good place. Now, was it very competitive back then as well? Yeah, very competitive. It's actually more competitive now. It's even harder to get in now because the small markets are drying up. Back when I was in Yuma, we had CBS, ABC, NBC. Mm -hmm. They all had their own stations. Right. And they all had their own newscasts. In Good fact, point. the station I was with, we did, you know, we did morning news, noon. We were doing five and a half, six hours of news a day. Mm -hmm. So we had a full staff of people. Now, yep. in Yuma, there's one station. Right. There's, there's three affiliates still, but they're all under one roof. They do one newscast a day. Mm -hmm. So when, when I was there, there were, you know, there were 100 jobs in Yuma. Now there's 11. So for these kids that are trying to get in and start their careers, you know, it's daunting because there's just not that many places to start. Local news has really been hurt by cable news, you know. And I, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful to work for Fox News Channel because I, you know, I think it's been a fantastic company. But local news stations, because of that, because there's so many eyeballs on cable news, national news, that local news has really dried up. And it's become a problem for kids getting into broadcast journalism because the jobs, especially in sports, you know, you figure there's, there's 10 sure. news jobs for every one sports job. Yep. So for every guy like Colin to get a job, there's, you know, there's a much better chance of getting a news job. You know? And you think, for me, it was, you know, it was, it was you gotta take that job. Yeah. Jobs, even then, now I tell these kids, look, if you get offered any job, you've got to grab it. you got to grab it. So, so what happens then? So, so you're in Yuma, you, you move, uh, and are, you said things just start accelerating? Yeah, I went to Boise, Idaho. The, the locals call it. You know, everybody says Boise. Well, it's actually Boise. If you're in Idaho, okay. it's Boise. Boise. So the first thing I tell you when you're doing news here is it's Boise, Idaho. Pronounce it right. Not Boise. Right. So... Um, and then you leave again, and now I call it Boise. Because everybody else goes, why are, why are you saying Boise? Well, that's actually what it's called, but okay. So I went to Boise, Idaho, and I thought the, the deal was, you know, I was the number one station there, the NBC affiliate, and I still didn't really know what I was doing. You know, I knew a little bit from, from Yuma, and, but Boise was a great teaching market because it's a capital city. It's mm -hmm. a great little place to live. It's, if, if you haven't been to Boise, if you haven't been to Boise, Idaho, it's Check a really it fantastic place. Yeah. I mean, it really is. So I went there, and because it was a capital city, it was a great news market because it was all political. You know, you learned, you learned how the political spin, you know, the, the different partisan issues. You learned how to cover politics, which is a big part of being in broadcast journalism, especially now in the days of Trump. Sure. But back in Boise, it was invaluable to me because I was at a good station, and... There was great reporters there who had been there for a long time. And it wasn't like Yuma where everybody comes in and leaves in a year. In Boise, Idaho, we had people that had been there for 20 years and are still there to, to mm -hmm. this day. Well, maybe not, but, but you know, we have an anchor who was there for, had been there for 10 years and she is still there today. And she is, and it's market, I think it's like market 120. There's only 180 markets. Okay. This was market 120, so not a big market, but a great place to live and she stayed. And I always said, as I came up through the ranks, she was one of, if not the best, female news anchor I had ever seen. And to this day, I think, it's, I think she still is. What's her name? Her name is Dee Sarton. Hmm. And she's extraordinarily talented, was then, is now, and of all the news anchors you see, even on the networks, she was the best. If you ever go into Boise, Idaho, and you turn around, you're like, that's a good wow. news anchor. That is a personable, really good news anchor. So why wouldn't someone like her <clears throat> Elevate to a national. She got many offers. I mean, okay. she got for to go to Seattle and Portland and come up and come up because she loved Boise. She, likes it. Okay. she her her husband was there. He had a job, and they just and it's a great little town. Sure, it's a great place to raise your kids. Snow skiing is ten minutes away. Water skiing is ten minutes away. Golf courses. They've got. I mean, it really is a, a really nice place. And if I was a doctor or a lawyer, 
or I wanted to stay in Boise, I, I, you know, I probably would have. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd just stayed there and, and been very happy. But in television, the game is, especially for for a young guy who's a reporter looking to kind of rise to the ranks, you got to keep moving. Yeah, you got to keep moving. So I was in Boise for about two and a half years, and then Vegas called, and. Vegas was, you know, at that time it was market like 60. Vegas okay. is like market 40 now. I mean, wow. Vegas has Growing. exploded. Sure. But Vegas at the time was market 60 and big market, big jump for me. And again, you know, you're $25,000 and that's every year. <laughs> so, so for me, it was a big deal because you're like, wow, <laughs> you know, this is a, it was just a reporter job. And I was the, in Boise at the time, I was the weekend anchor. But the news director in Vegas said, listen, we've got, a, we've got a weekend anchor opening coming up in about four or five months. If you'll you know, just hang in there, take the reporter job, we can pretty much guarantee we're going to slide you into the weekend anchor slot. So um, I took the job and was in Vegas and, and you know, my life just, I mean, it just changed mm. dramatically. I mean, it just, I went from the girl I had been dating in San Diego, that kind of fell apart when I was in Yuma because it was just, even though it was only a couple hours away, just didn't work out, mm -hmm. right? She, did, she had no desire to go live in Yuma, Arizona. I don't blame her. And she had no desire to go live in Boise, Idaho. So that kind of ended. And um, Vegas opened the door for me meeting people like Colin and Glennie and my wife whose name is Tracy. Okay. So it was Trace, Trace and, and Tracy. Tracy. <laughs> people cool. lie. And my name, my really, my mural name is Tracy. So, you know, my dad started calling me Trace as a, as a, you know, as a very young boy. So I've gone by Trace for most of my life. But yeah, it's Trace, Trace and Tracy. Unbelievable. Who met on a blind date that in Vegas and Tracy tried to cancel the date. Just a great story. Yeah. Just a great story. And so then we were in Vegas and, you know, I was going to take, there was a, a job offer in Los Angeles and there was a couple of job offers, but the, the money wasn't really what we thought it was going to be. And so we ended up taking a job in Orlando, Florida, as a weekend anchor. And the cost of living in Orlando at the time was, was exceptional, mm -hmm. right? And sure. the money was pretty good. And so we, I said, hey, I know I don't, we don't know each other that well, but um, I'm moving across country. You want to go? She said, yeah, let's go. That's so great. we moved to Orlando. How long did you spend there? I was in Orlando for three years. Okay. Great news market. I tell everybody, I said, you know, all these young kids that come in, we mentor a lot of kids. And I said, if you can get to Florida, your tape is going to be amazing. Your resume tape will be amazing. Try to get into a Florida market because everything weird in the world happens in Florida. You get hurricanes, you get, you know, you get uh, Casey Anthony kind type yeah, stories. Right. Every bizarre thing in the world for some reason happens in Florida. So it's the best news state in the country. The floor, the recall, right? Yep. The, I mean, the, the 2000 election, right. you know, Gore. Gore v. Bush, Florida, you know, hurricanes, you name it, Florida is, it's just the mecca for news. And at the time, you know, Tiger Woods was living in, That's in Orlando right. and Shaquille O'Neal and you had all these. So you know, you, these another stories. great time to be where you were. Great time to be there, right? Yeah. It was a great time to be in Orlando. And that's when, you know, in two years, um, my first agent, I got an agent in Orlando finally. And um, two years later, I was, you know, I would send him stuff and you get job offers. We're getting I mean, legitimate job offers wow. were coming in. And that's when Fox News Channel called and they said, um, hey, we're starting this brand new cable news wow. thing. I remember. Roger Ailes called and he said, hey, we'd like to, we'd like to bring you on board. And I said, what's a Fox? What? It didn't exist. There was nothing, right? Right. And I knew there were Fox who were doing some affiliate <laughs> stuff. <laughs> you know what it makes me think of? Do you remember, did you used to watch David Letterman? Yeah. He used to make fun of this little, <laughs> this little station called Fox. Right. He used to say it all the time. Right. But I remember back then, that's yeah. what he used to say. Right. No one knew. It was no. brand new. And it was terrible. When, when it first started, you know, in, in uh, October 7th of 1996, when we first went on the air, we moved to Chicago. And we gave up the Orlando thing and we, you know, we were in the process of buying a house and we pulled out of wow. escrow. So we were, I mean, we were locked in. We were going to be there for a long time. And then the Fox job came up, so we moved to Chicago. And they signed us to six-month contracts. That's all they would sign us mm. for because they had no idea if this thing was going to work. So we moved to Orlando. It was a big risk. And the first day we were on the air, October 7th of 1996, I looked at my wife and I thought, we're out of, we're out of a job. We are, this thing is not going to last. It might not last till Friday. It was just that bad mistakes and you know just it was it was really bad television 
And why do you think? I mean, were they just, did they rush to? Brand to, new. Well, yeah. it was just brand new. And, and you know, they, they didn't have any advertisers, so they would run infomercials. They would run, you know, these, these public service announcements. And we were in, I think, 11 million households in the country. Cable saturation was 85 million. We had to pay people, you know. Rupert Murdoch would pay people <laughs> to take the channel. He said, we'll pay you a buck a month if you'll just air Fox News Channel, because nobody wanted it. We've got a CNN. There's MSNBC just started three months before that. We don't need a third cable news thing. Just try it. Just, you know, we'll give you a buck. So they got to 11 million, and then they got to 20 million, and in a couple of years, we're in 35 million. And then Columbine happened. And Columbine was one of those stories that changed everything. You know, we got to Columbine, and nobody had, had seen anything like it. And it was one of those things where you had gun control. That was a big part of it. So, you know, now, just for reference, we'll go to a school shooting now, and we'll be there for a couple, three days. You know, that's just because we've seen so many of them in the, over the years. We go, we're there for three or four days, two or three days, and you move on to the next story. We were at Columbine for three weeks, wow. and it was the lead story for three weeks, and nobody got tired of it. Mm. There was something new every day, and just, the, just the, 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 the details of what happened inside that school kept coming out, and it was riveting, and it was just the saddest most unbelievable story we'd ever covered. And because it was resonating so much, people started watching Fox News Channel because Bill O'Reilly was just then, he was kind of, he was making his mark and he was getting a little bit of notoriety and they were writing articles and he was controversial and stuff. So Bill O'Reilly started to kind of gin things up at Fox. And this is 1999, three years after. And you know, we'd go for the first three years, we'd go to these news things whatever event was happening, and we'd say, we're from Fox News Channel. They're like, uh, Channel 11? No, no, it's, um, it's like CNN, only different. Yeah, okay, whatever, you're over there. So, you know, that's the deal. And then Columbine happened, and you notice that, you know, a year later, all of a sudden the numbers start to tick up, and we're in 55 million homes. And then 9-11 happens, and we're in 85 million homes, wow. fully saturated. And shortly after 9-11, we were the number one cable news network and it's been like that for for what 20 years 19 incredible, years incredible incredible so uh yeah i mean it, it's it's one of those things where on day one you looked at it and thought man oh man this is not going to make it and then 23 years later you look at it and you think man this this roger ailes and you know roger clearly had some demons and we know that sure. things he had but but what a brilliant guy what a yeah. sweet man what a brilliant man was always very kind to me and you think the vision of, of saying, you know, this country really needs something like this is, is t to me, to this day, is still a phenomenal thing. And you were there from the very beginning. Right. Is anyone else in, in the same boat? Shepard is, is an original. Okay. Shepard Smith was there. In fact, Shepard and I worked in Orlando together. Okay. So we did local news together, and I took Shepard's job. So he was overlapped with me. So they hired me from Vegas to take Shepard's job because he was going to Miami. I see. So um, we had similar styles. In fact, we kind of came up through the same system. And, and back then, it was all about, you know, they were just starting to walk and talk. There was a guy named Joel Cheatwood who was a news director in Miami. And he was kind of the architect of the, of the walk and talk, the live shots, where you can't just sit there like the old days and, you know. And, and then in the early 90s, you know, CNN was still doing that. Stand in front of the White House and you do it. And, and we started doing, you know, Shepard and, and me and a few other reporters started doing this walk and talk thing where everything we would do, every live thought, shot we would go to, we would start walking around showing things, right? Totally different way of doing the news. And so that's the reason Fox loved Shepard because of that. They loved my tape for doing that kind of stuff because they wanted that. They wanted sure. that energy as part of their, as part of, you know, their, their, new, their new model for their, for their news channel. So yeah, Shepard and I worked briefly uh, together in Orlando, then he went to Miami, and then he went to, uh, he went to a national news magazine that was owned by Fox. Okay. And when Fox News Channel started, they owned his contract, and they said, hey, come work for us. And he's like, okay. So he went and worked for them, and you know, he's done very well. So he's an original, and um, I'm trying to think. There's not many. Not too, not too many. Not many left. I mean, there's, jeez, uh, I, I can't even think. There's some producers that have been there the whole time. But on the air, I think there's probably maybe 12 or 13 people left that are, that are 1996 originals. Incredible. Well, congratulations. Yeah. That's, that's quite a... Yeah, it's yeah. fantastic. And it's been a great company. I mean, it's just been a great company. And, 
you know, I was in Chicago for a year and it was too cold for too long and we were covering stories all over the country and all over the world and stuff and there was an opening in, there was an opening in both Los Angeles and San Francisco and they said, take either one, which one do you want? And I said, I think I'll go to LA and then we flew to San Francisco and I thought, I'm going to come here. So we lived in San Francisco for a couple of years and then went to LA. And you're on assignment at that point? You just with the channel and just different bureaus. They were opening different bureaus. They, okay. knew after, they knew after six months, after a year, this channel is going to work. This channel is going to be a star. So that's when they said, okay, we need to beef up some of our bureaus. So we did really good work in Chicago. And, you know, the vice president of news called me and said, listen, we've got openings in the West Coast. I know you're a West Coast guy. We want to go to L.A.? Want to go to San Francisco? And I said, I'd love to go to L.A. And he said, well, you know, I'm going to fly you to both go check out San Francisco and I went with my wife to San Francisco and she's like man it's beautiful here so we'd never lived in San Francisco sure. How nice. so we went there and uh, I was there for for a couple of years and then went to LA okay. after that and you've been here ever since went to been went to LA and was stayed there for about six years and then lived in New York went to Connecticut oh, okay we and lived in Westport that's Connecticut right. for uh, for five years and then I was working out of New York then I was anchoring the weekends. I was doing uh, Studio B back then on the weekends and the Fox Report on the weekends. And then I became Shepard's uh, chief correspondent. And then I started doing a show with Martha McCallum. Yes. Uh, who's now doing her own show. We did this one o'clock to three o'clock show every day called The Live Desk. And that lasted for a couple of years. And then that show went away. And uh, then I came back to Los Angeles because they were starting to beef up breaking news and all kinds of stuff in Los Angeles. So I came out here and they built the studio out here. So now we can do shows out of LA, which is, you know, it just yeah. adds one more dimension to, to Fox News Channel. So we've been back out here now for, for seven or eight years. Great. Yeah. So what do you like better? Do you, do you, do you like being behind the microphone? Do you, do you like being the anchor? Do you like both? I like both. I mean, it's kind of a nice mix, you know? I mean, really, it's nice to be able to get out and cover stories. You know, when there's big stories, it's, it's fun to be able to go out and cover them because that's what we did for so long, you know, for the first... 15 or 16 years that was with Fox, that's all we did. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're on a plane all the time, you're traveling, you're in Southeast Asia because of the tsunami, yeah. right? You're on the border of, of Israel and Lebanon because of the Israeli, you know, Hezbollah war. So you're, you're in a different place every month, you know, and it's great for a while until, you know, you get 15, 16 years of that and you get kids and, you know, you missed vacations and you're, you know, some of this stuff after a while, you're like, you know, I'd love to be able to sit in, in a studio for a month mm -hmm. and not have to go anywhere or a couple of months, sure. you know? So it's, it was, it's a nice mix to be able to sit and anchor some shows and be able to cover some breaking news inside and, and you know, be live on the shows and, you know, be part of different shows like, like I'm doing now and part of Martha McCallum's show. And, you know, we do a lot of stuff for Shep. We're Shep's primary fill-in. We do a lot of stuff for Tucker Carlson. Um, you know, Hannity and then the Late Show and stuff. So, you know, it's, it's great. It's a great platform for me. And I've had so many different jobs in Fox. You, know, you never know. We could be back in New York tomorrow, mm -hmm. next year, maybe never. Right. You never know. You right. never know what's going to happen. But it's been, for 23 years, it's been really, it's been a great ride. And they have been, they have really been a, just a spectacular company to work for. That's awesome. Can you talk a little bit about um, the mindset of Someone like yourself that was going up through the ranks, is, are things too, happening too fast to even consider it? Or are you, are you in a mindset that, yes, I wanna, this is a stepping stone and I wanna elevate my career. Are you trying to elevate your career at, <coughs> in, in those early days? Or yeah, are you always, I mean, you're always trying. And in, in the early days of Fox, and I feel bad, <coughs> excuse me, for younger correspondents who come in now because, you know, they don't get as much airtime as we used to get. When I first came in with Fox, I was on, you know, I was on every day and you're on multiple times a day. So the Roger Ailes of the world and the, the vice presidents can see you every single day. So your career moves up, you know, you're moving up through the ranks. Now, these young correspondents who come in, we have so many correspondents. Yeah. It's tough to get on the air. Yeah. So they don't hit air as much as they should be or as much as they want to be. And that's a problem for them because you have, a, you have a tough time elevating your career when you were hired to cover weekends or overnights at Fox News Channel and the people who are, who are elevating people 
haven't seen you on TV in a couple of weeks, you know, or they see yeah. you on TV and they see you uh, here. Oh yeah, I love that. Oh yeah, and then you're not on TV for two weeks, or they don't see you for two weeks. So it's a problem. Back when I was, you know, coming in to Fox, I was was on all the time. Sure. We only had, you know, there was me and Shepard and a couple of other people. That's all. We were covering the whole country. So we were on every day yeah. in a different place every day. If they didn't like your work, you know, you you were quickly out. Yeah. But if they did, you were quickly elevated. But so how, how are you preparing? So even back then, how are you preparing for your, you know, your lives? Well, I mean, you know, the, the idea is when we, when we hit the ground, you have people gathering information. You know, we hit the ground in Southeast Asia in the tsunami. And it was hard because it was just so it was just so gruesome. I mean, when we got to when we got to uh, Thailand, you know, when we when we pulled up, there were still bodies in trees. Oh God! You know, and they were they were bodies that were stacked up in mosques. It looked like cordwood in there. So it was so gruesome. It was really kind of hard to 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 kind of encapsulate this into a two minute report because there was so much video and so much grief and tragedy and just, and you know, horror scenes. You're thinking, I don't know what I cover. You know, what, what do you start with? You start with bodies, you start with people that are walking up and down. And you know, we saw it in 9-11 where people were looking for their loved ones, right? In 9-11, mm. this was on a scale 15 times that because there were hundreds of thousands of people who lost their lives. And the Germans would come to to Thailand, it was kind of their Hawaii, right? For Germany sure. and for some of these, for some of these uh, Eastern Bloc countries, this is their Hawaii. They go to Thailand all the time, and the be beaches are beautiful, and it's the people are wonderful, and it's really one of those great places. And when the tsunami hit, you had all these different foreigners that were wiped out, and you would see some of these people, some Germans and some you know Austrians, and they were walking the streets and they were holding pictures up of their kids, and they're saying, "Have you seen my kid?" you seen my kid and, and I, you know, you're looking at them and they're just heartbreaking. And they say, no, no, you don't understand. My, my daughter was, you know, she's a super good swimmer, really good swimmer. You have no idea. She's great. And it's just, you, how, what do you, how do you answer that, right? right. I mean, none of these people are ever found. And so, so when you get on the ground in stories like that, it's tough. I mean, it's tough to really gather everything and try and say, okay, I've got two minutes. What do I tell the world? What do I tell the United States that's going on here? So you have a little bit of that. But it's one of those things where you really do, at that point in time, you have to walk around, you have to show people where the water came. You gotta show them the damage in the cliffs and how hotels that were, you know, were just 35 feet up, not a, not a bit of damage. And yet, if you were below 35 feet, it was gone. The whole island was gone. And so, you know, those are tough stories to tell. You know, you get into a situation where Columbine, Columbine, it's moving so fast. The information is coming out. We were on the ground four hours, five hours after the shooting, and we're immediately starting live shots, right? You're immediately going on. And you're trying to gather this information, and you think, and it's all changing. It's all changing. And it was bombs first. It was, it was supposed to be a bombing. No, it was a shooting, and then there, were, there was a hand grenade, and then all the false things come out. Like after 9-11, when all the anthrax yeah. threats were coming out, and there were so many different stories that people thought, there's, no, there's another attack happening here, and there's an attack. That's the thing. It just kind of spawns its own, its own news cycle. So tell us, in, in the moment, how, you, are you making these decisions? Do you have someone with you that you're... you're we have producers that producers? are gathering. We have people that are out gathering video, that are out gathering information. We're listening to the police, but the police really only know half the story because the investigators haven't got on scene yet. You still have all these kids with these, you know, fatal wounds inside, and the coroner hasn't done his job, and so the information, nobody really knew. So you're taking, you know, bits and pieces of what they're giving you, and the reporting on on hour one, hour five, is much different than it is on day four, when the picture is becoming much clearer. And the videotapes of this Dylan Klebold, and you know, the, the videotapes of him in his room promising all this stuff, and the weird stuff, then you have a much clearer idea of what happened. But when you get on the scene, you're, you're just struggling to get any information that can, and then you know, you, you also have to have, it's got, you gotta be accurate. So, sure. you know, you're, you're trying to double source everything. You're trying to get it from somebody else, unless they're giving you, uh, a, you know, a news conference. Unless the sheriff or somebody's coming out and giving a news conference, you, you got to double source your stuff, so that you're not given bad information. So it's hard in the in the early going when you get to any scene because you know you've got so much information to absorb, 
and then to try and, and spit back out is, you know, is a task in a lot of cases. Does it ever get emotional? It does. I mean, you know, Columbine was, clearly, Columbine, because we'd never seen anything like it. So when you arrive on the scene in Columbine, you know, everybody was the same way. They're just, it was just, you know, like the whole, the whole town, the whole city was just in shock. And journalists would walk around thinking, oh my God, 9-11, the same thing. You'd go down to Grand Zero and you think, even days after and yeah. weeks after, just the whole feeling down there, just like the whole world has just changed. Yeah. So those are the stories, Columbine, 9-11, those are, those are really world altering stories because it changes, you know, the, the, it just takes a little bit of the innocence away from that the country had before then. And, you know, it just, it's, it's gone. When you go to war zones and stuff, you see so much tragedy. You see these kids in the Middle East. I mean, we spent 40 days in Bethlehem, and it's like a biblical thing. We spent 40 days and 40 That's nights right. in Bethlehem Interesting. while the militants were inside the Church of the Nativity where Jesus was, was born, right? And they wouldn't give up the church. So we were in Bethlehem, me and Geraldo Rivera, and we had a couple of other correspondents there, but we spent 40 nights in Bethlehem. We couldn't get any food because it was the whole city was in lockdown. We had all the Pringles potato chips in the world. We had we had we had beer. We had boatloads of beer, huh. but we couldn't get any food. We couldn't get pizzas delivered. We couldn't get anything in there. So it was it was you know it was a, a rough time. time. It was a rough time. And then you know when they finally left, the militants finally left the church. You go in and they had um, they had a French cardinal came in and celebrated the mass in French. You know, and you, you walk in, you think, this is just amazing. It's amazing to be in the church of nativity. It was all vandalized. Mm -hmm. You know, they had, they had destroyed some, really some precious items. But to be in there while the French cardinal, who, who really at that point in time was, was thought to be in line for, to pope. become pope, to celebrate the mass, was, was amazing. Really, it was just, it was one of those things where like, that is, who spends 40 days in Bethlehem? Right. And, you know, and you would, you would speak to the Israeli generals. And I tell people, I say, it's so funny because, you know, in, in Israel, mandatory military, right? Everybody serves in the military. Men, women, right. you serve at 18, you go in the military for two years. And I tell them, you know, in, in Israel, I've covered a couple of different kind of conflicts over there. And they really try to do it nine to five. You know, the wars over in Israel are kind of nine to five, at least for the generals. The generals at 530 really like to be having a couple of cocktails and talking about... Strategy. strategy for the next day. And I, was, I tell people, I say, you know, one of the funniest jokes that, that I've ever heard was told to me by an Israeli general, and if I can share it with Please. you. Please. So the Israeli general tells me, he says, you know, it's so funny, he, was, he, he said, I tell this to every American that comes in. And he tells a story about this woman who was American, and she went to see Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. And she was so struck by the movie that she had to go to the Holy Land. So she went to Israel, and she walked the Stations of the Christ cross. She went to Bethlehem, right? She went to the Holy Wall. She went everywhere and she was so struck by it. And then she died. Sadly, she died. So the Israeli consulate calls her only daughter. And the Israeli consulate says, I'm so, so sad to tell you this, but your mother passed away here in the Holy Land. And the daughter is so distraught that she hands the phone to her husband. So the son-in-law gets on the phone and the Israeli consulate says, I was just telling your wife that, you know, we have two ways we can do this. We can either bury your mother-in-law right here in the Holy Land, 1500 maybe $2,000, or send the body home, $20,000. The son-in-law says, send her home. The Israeli consulate's kind of struck. He's like, you know, look, she loved the Holy Land, $1,500, 20 large to send her home. And the son-in-law says, listen, 2,000 years ago, you buried some guy, and three days later, he rose from the dead, and I cannot take that <laughs> chance. That's good. That a great the general joke. told you that. That's so good. the general told that joke, and um, you know, you you're whether you're the American colony, which is a great old hotel in Jerusalem and stuff. Yeah, you would walk, you would meet with the generals, and you would find out where do we go tomorrow? What should we do? What's the strategy? What's going on? And they would they would be in there, and they would tell you. Wow. So it was fascinating. It's one place I really want want to go is uh, Israel. Oh, it's it's amazing. Have you been back? I've been, uh, yeah, I've been three times. Okay. So uh, I went for the, the second intifada mm -hmm. in the early 2000s, and then I went back for the Israeli Hezbollah war. We were up on the, we were up on, in uh, Kiryat Shimona, which is in the northern part of the country, right there on the border, right on the border wow. with Lebanon. And 
it was kind of freaky because you know Hezbollah was firing these Katusha rockets in, right? And you know Israel firing mortars, and we were right on the border. And you could lay, lay in bed at night. You're sitting there, and you're going, they're going over you. And the theory was, well, look, you're in a hotel. If you're in a hotel, you're right thing. They're firing that way. You're firing that way. You should be great, right? Well, yeah, and great in theory, except sure. two weeks later, both sides are pushing each other, pushing each other back. And now, instead of flying over, the, the bombs are landing just Closer. on the other side. So, yeah. Were you ever fearful? Mm, yeah, then, then I was. Because we had, you know, we had... They, they, they can't control these Katusha rockets. So it's not a matter of, hey, they're trying to shoot. They're, just, they're sending them willy-nilly. Nobody knows where they're going to land. Mm -hmm. So you're on the roof and you're doing live shots. And, you know, you hear boom, 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 and you're in the flak jacket. And, and it's just, it's, uh, yeah, it's a little disconcerting to be up where there are bombs and stuff. Yeah, I can only imagine. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's interesting now how the news is covered. It's, you know, we used to go... We, you know, I was talking about how we would spend so much time in a different story, but now the news cycle has, has sped up so much. Yeah. 24 hour news cycle. And, you know, people, people get tired of the same story. So in the days when we would go down to a major hurricane, I mean, Hurricane Andrew, when it, when it struck <laughs> South Florida in the early 90s, I mean, you know, months and months and months. We were at Katrina. When Katrina hit New Orleans, I was in New Orleans for months mm. and months. You'd fly in, you'd stay for a week, stay for two weeks, fly out, you'd come back a week later, stay for two weeks. I mean, it went on for, it went on for years because of the rebuilding and so forth. And it was one of those stories that really changed the whole, the whole infrastructure of, of how America thinks about building cities and, and you know, one of the great cities in this country. Yeah. It just changed everything. And so you go back and you watch the rebuilding and you still, you go to the Ninth Ward to this day and you walk in there and it's, it's a mess. Wow. I mean, it's just... It's an, it's an amazing uh, display of, of what was done right and what was done wrong and then how, you know, Mother Nature just comes in and yeah, like just that. takes it all away like that. It's amazing. So now, you know, you go into to a story and you think we could be here for a long time and it, it just doesn't resonate. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't resonate for long enough. And you, you wonder why. I mean, you think, man, the, the shooting in Las Vegas. The shooting in Las Vegas, you know, we were there for probably a week, four or five days. You know, that's one of those places. It was the, the worst mass shooting in U.S. history. We would have been there for a month 20 years ago. Mm. And we were there for a week. And you start moving on because there's something else happening, you know, because the news cycle is changing so fast. Trump tweets something and the news cycle changes. So, you know, you have to be very careful now when you're covering the news because you can't just ignore, you know, you can't just pull cameras out because, because the president tweeted something. You know, you have to kind of really, you have to kind of weigh what really is beneficial and why are you changing the news cycle. And so these producers go through these, you know, these heartrending discussions about <laughs> are we doing the right thing? Are we pulling the cameras out at the right time? And I think the answer a, a lot of times is, well, you're, you're just kind of, that's the way life is now. The news cycle has sped yeah. to a point where it changes so, so often fast. that you don't spend nearly as much time as you should or might have in the old days on, on single stories, which is, which is, it's really, it's kind of, it blows me away. Yeah. It's phenomenal. And it's just the consumption, right? The, the consumer yeah. consumption of, right. of, of media, the way it's, it's everything yeah. with social media social. and everything else it's it's, cool. it's they yeah. want it now yeah. i mean it's everything it's now and then we can you've got my attention for you know a a, a minute an hour two hours whatever it is and now yep. i'm done now i want to move on and so that's kind of what we have to do we reflect the what what the audience wants sure so trace let's talk about journalistic responsibility mm -hmm. um First off, I'm I'm just really good. either I'm really naive or or I, I I'm like a lot of people in that I always thought that journalists are supposed to be very neutral. Right. News stations are supposed to be very neutral. Mm -hmm. we're, we obviously know we're living in a time that is like no other. Right. You're on one side of it, where I would I don't know at least half of the population. Right. It's not happy with, with, say, a Fox News. But when I look, you know, I, I, I honest, with, with, with my show, with everything I do, I try to stay pretty neutral because right. 
I don't think extreme is good one way or the other. Um, but what's happening today? What's yeah, happening? Because you've it, been there for 30 right, plus years And I'm now. a journalist. Look, I'm a broadcast journalist and I tell everybody, I try as hard as I can, I try not to take sides. Look, you know, I, we're umpires. We are there to call balls and strikes. That's our job. We're not there. We're not opinion people. We're not advocates, right? It's not advocacy. It's journalism, not activism. Right. And you see a lot of activist journalists now. And you look to some of their stations, and it's nothing but opinion journalism. There's nobody who's just giving you the facts. It's just opinion journalism. And I'm, I labor every day to look, if the president does something that needs to be acknowledged is good, I acknowledge it. If the president does something that, that is not beneficial to this country, I acknowledge it. That's my job. That's what I do. You know, you can't just, I'm on, you know, I'm on Tucker Carlson's show. I'm on Sean Hannity's show. I know their direction. I know those are opinion people. Their editorial direction is going to be very pro-Trump. I get it. But that's not my job. My job is when they put me on their show, I, I tell them all, oh, look, the deal is I'm giving you, I'm giving you both sides. I'm going to give it to you straight down the middle because that's what we do. That's what I do. That's my job. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to pick fights with the president, and, and a lot of journalists are. I'm not trying to get on Stephen Colbert's show because I'm, you know, I'm an anti-Trump journalist. I'm just trying to cover the news. I'm trying to call balls and strikes. Yeah. Call it the way that I see them. Clearly, every journalist has, has inherent bias, mm -hmm. you know, whether you show it or not. There's, you believe things. We're all human. We believe things, and we believe this is screwed up, and this is proper, and, you know, that's, you bring these in. But, but you also have to just look at the facts, and you have to kind of give both sides of the story. You have to tell them, look, the president did this today, and, and this is going to work out well. The president did this today, and it's not going to work out well. You know, this was, an, this was a bad idea because the experts said this is a bad idea. This, the experts said, is actually going to do really, really beneficial things for the country. But on some stations, you're not getting the, they said this is going to be beneficial. You're not getting any of that. And you think, why? Why wouldn't you at least, look, you know, you can't, if, if you know, in some stations, you look at it and you think, come on, you know, if, if Trump came out tomorrow and cured cancer, they'd say, but look at all the doctors he's putting out of, out of you know, there's going to be a negative right. spin to it. And you think, you know, some of it's just not fair. When he calls fake news, you know, sometimes he doesn't do himself any favors. The tweeting and the stuff that he does, he's not doing himself any favors at all. But he has done some good things in his time in office, and they should be recognized. He's done some bad things. So when he says, you know, it's fake news because news is, you know, is negative toward him, well, you know, some of that stuff's negative. A lot of stuff you're not helping yourself. But at the same time, there are some, some positive issues that are also not being recognized. So I think journalists now need to take a step back and just back out of the whole activist thing and just start calling balls and strikes. Go back to, you know, we've got a couple of sources. Stop with the mistakes. There's been so many mistakes made in journalism across the board, newspapers and radio and television. So many mistakes. Recently, because, you mean? Recently. Yeah. I mean, recently. Right. And I'm not going to name names, sure. but there have been... I mean, just numerous journalistic mistakes. You know, the whole, the Covington thing. I mean, yep. Pretty much everybody across the board got that one wrong. They got it wrong because they jumped the gun and they, look, it was, you were wrong. Come out and say, we screwed that up, right? You were wrong. But that didn't Watch happen. the whole thing. It's all about context. And I said, I did the story on Monday night and the whole thing is two hours of tape. There's two hours of videotape you have to watch the two hours or have a producer watch the two hours. You can't just go on two minutes of videotape and then and, and say, this is what happened. You have no idea what happened. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it, and that's it, where the responsibility comes in, right? Right. And it goes back to, you know, it goes back to, uh, it goes back to Trayvon Martin, right? Trayvon Martin in Florida. And you had MSNBC that when, when uh, I can't remember his name, uh, George uh, Zimmerman, mm -hmm. right? who shot Trayvon Martin. Mm -hmm. And George Zimmerman was on the phone with, with the police dispatch, right? While Trayvon Martin was walking around in this community. And you had MSNBC did the video, cut the videotape where it said, the, the operator said, can you describe him? And he said, well, I can't get a good look at him. He looks black. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. No, he looks suspicious. He looks suspicious. He looks black. Now, 
That was 35 minutes after, so they cut that together. That's not journalism. He yeah. said, I can't get a good look at him, he looks suspicious. And then 30 minutes later, when he's walking around on this phone call, or eight minutes later, nine minutes later, whatever it was, that's when he said, he looks, he, I think he's black, he looks black. They clipped him together to make it look like I mean, that's a racist Why? statement because because Ratings? it fits the narrative yeah. because it Why? doesn't if it doesn't fit the narrative you just that is make so it. wrong it's so journalistic that really and they fired me. people because of it but that's the whole point the whole point is is you can't do that but they're doing it because it fits the narrative they have already drawn conclusions uh, you know newspapers and radio and you know Everybody has already drawn conclusions and they're looking for facts to fit those conclusions. That's what they do. They go out and they say, okay, that fact doesn't fit our conclusion. Yeah, yeah. And it's not right. Michael Brown, the Michael Brown case. You know, our, my whole thing was, look, let's just wait and see what the Department of Justice comes to. Let's wait before we start saying that this one's guilty and this is the thing. The officer is, you know, we had the one legal analyst said that Michael Brown was, you know, executed in broad daylight. And you think, you, you know, the Department of Justice came out later and said, that's absolutely not, not correct. The Obama Department of Justice came out and said, that's absolutely not correct. That was a justified shooting, but, but you have media outlets that have already drawn their conclusions and they are looking for the narrative and that narrative you know sometimes is is you know it causes bad effects you talk sure. about what happened in Ferguson Missouri you know the riots oh, it was you awful. Name it. it was unbelievable just fomenting just fomenting this stuff and I you know that's one of those things where as a journalist you think come on you can't do that you can't do that you just have to say we don't know enough right now to be able to say that this happened or this happened. We're learning, we're getting, here's what we do know. And here's what, what experts on both sides are saying about it. Here's what police are saying. Here's what you know these advocates are saying. We don't know enough to draw conclusions. You can't just start with a conclusion and then hope to fill in the facts in, in, the, in the coming days. Doesn't work. And I tell these interns that come in, these young kids, I say, you know, you, you just, you have to play it straight. You have to be it straight. You're going to have a long career. You can be, you know, you can be a journalist, activism, whatever your, whatever your thing is, and you can try and be a, you know, a showboat and try and be a big star, but it, you're going to flame out. You're going to have a long career. If you call balls and strikes, if you play it honest, you're going to have a very long, successful career. Maybe you're not going to have your 15 minutes of fame, and maybe you're not going to get on Colbert or the other late night shows. But, but you're going to have a long career. And the guy who's on Colbert in two years is not going to be around. You know, whatever happened to that guy? Well, he, That's right. He was on Colbert and he wrote a couple of books and I don't know. That's great Nobody's advice. Nobody's going to hire him now because he's, he's a liability. Sure. Have you ever made uh, any blunders in your all early the time. days? Oh, I mean, you know, mistakes all the time. Mm -hmm. We make mistakes. I mean, you know, there's sometimes where where we cover breaking news like we have for, for 23 years. You know, when breaking news happens, Shepard Smith and I will go on the air, oftentimes, and cover hours of news, just going back and forth and, you know, trying to figure out what's happening. And we, you know, we've tried to get to a point where, where we're very careful about terminology and what you say and how you say it. And so you're you strategizing. Scare, yeah, you don't want to scare any families. You don't want to say things that, that you don't know. So we're good about it. But look, in the early goings, when you have breaking news, mistakes are made. You know, you, you have information that comes in that was bad information, right? Maybe given to you by a law enforcement source. Mistakes are made. You make mistakes all the time. You try to correct them and you move on. You know, I've, look, I've, you, know, you screw up different things a lot, yeah. but you try not to. I mean, the whole idea is you try, to, you try to go in and you try to fill in the facts that you have to paint a portrait of what you think is happening with this news story at this point in time without saying, well, you know, here's the bottom line and here's, we don't know the bottom line. Mm -hmm. You know, most often until days later, we don't know the bottom line. There's no way we're gonna know the bottom line right now. So we don't know, you know, we stay away in shootings, we stay away from numbers because they're always wrong. Yep. We stay away from, you know, um, accusations because they're always wrong. We stay away from timelines because they're always wrong, right? So you just kind of, you have to report on what you know is happening at that point in time, then that's, that's the best you can do. Sure. Do you feel that the media 
and the nation is looks at Fox and as you know the wicked stepchild I think some do I mean some do I think uh, you know some people on the left clearly look at Fox as thinking that that Fox is is evil the same way that some people on the right look at CNN and MSNBC thinking that's they're just not fair it's not fair that's not fair journalism yeah everybody has their opinion yeah sir I mean you know that's 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 the way it is some people look at some people look at Trump and love him, and some people look at him and hate him. It's the way America is. So, it, but is it, it, it is this time different than than the rest? I mean, uh, through Obama's administration, did you experience the same? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, through Obama's administration, we think you know Obama thought himself thought that Fox News Channel was against him. The same reason people say, "Oh, Trump, he's just against the media." No, Obama came out and said, "There's this one news organization." That is, that is here solely to tear down my administration. He was talking about Fox News Channel, yeah, right? I do remember that. So he yeah. said it, and nobody said, oh, nobody said, oh, he's trying to, he's trying to you know, muffle the press. He's trying to, no, he's just giving you his opinion. Trump says the same thing. He says the New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, MSNBC, ABC, CBS are all trying to knock down my administration. Yeah. That's his opinion. That's what he believes is true. So he is attack them as fake news, right? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it is it is what it is. Yeah. And the next president that comes in, liberal, conservative, Republican, <laughs> Democrat, the <laughs> they're going to say the same thing. They're yeah. going to say that if, you know, if it's a Democrat, that Fox News Channel hates them and Fox News Channel needs to be, someone needs to, the same thing that Trump is saying about CNN. Yeah. I mean, that's just the way it is. And again, I, I try, and I, I really don't watch much news anymore, um, but I try to balance it, right? And I try to say, okay, let me watch MSNBC, let me watch Fox, and just, right. you know, you just kind of try to hear both, and I don't even know if it's both sides, you just try to hear from different organizations, uh, what, you know, but it's just so vastly different on what's reported, you know, sometimes. Yeah. And, and look, I know your tagline is fair and balanced, you know, for, for the organization, right. and, and, you know, um, I think that's good. I think that's a great, you know that's a that's a great aim. Like you said, you're not going to always get it right, but no. it's a great aim. Look, we you know we have we have we have opinion shows. We have clearly you know Sean Hannity and right. Tucker Carlson and <laughs> and Ingram and yeah. look, these guys are all opinion people. Right. They are opinion people and they are very pro Trump. That's yeah. it. That's the deal, right? That's what they are. But you know, I think I watch Special Report with Brett Baer. I watch Martha Show. I watch um, you know Cavuto and other. And I think I see very fair reporting. Yeah. I see good journalism and I see very fair reporting. And sometimes I look at the other stations and I don't see that. I don't see a lot of that balance. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what bothers me is I look at, you know, I look at some of the headlines in the New York Times and the Washington Post and other websites and I just don't see a fairness there. I don't see people saying, you know what, this is kind of you know, and you see this inflammatory headline, and you think that's not a that's not that's not a news story. That's in a big opinion. You just mm -hmm. didn't put a big opinion yeah. at the top of your page. Yeah. So clearly, you know, look, Fox News Channel, we have we have a very strong opinion department, and and they do their work, and they're very good at it. Right? And they, you know, they they mobilize a lot of conservatives. But we also have a very good journalism department. We also have some very good reporters and journalists at Fox News Channel that I think are doing yeoman's work. Yeah. And I watch them every day and I think, that's pretty fair. That's pretty fair. And they, you know, sometimes Fox gets a bad rap. Oh, they're just, you know, that's state television. That's not state television. Mm -hmm. Watch Special Report. You, anybody watch Special Report, they are meticulous about making sure that every fact is, is checked and covered, that every source is true and that every story is balanced. I mean, they go to great lengths to do that. And so, you know, I think I'd, I would defy any journalism instructor or any network head to be able to look at that show or some other shows and say, yeah, that's, you know, they're, that's right-wing news, because it's not. That's good to hear. I wanted to talk about a couple of things like Michael Jackson, did you, you covered that? I covered I, Michael Jackson, I don't know if yeah. You want to cover I covered that. Michael Jackson. In fact, I covered it with a with a man. We just lost one of our colleagues this week. His name is Bob Massey, and Bob is a uh, was a legal analyst for us. He also did a real estate show, but but Michael Jackson was one of the first the first uh, big stories that we covered together, and just a brilliant mind. I mean, mm -hmm. Bob Massey, one is just a sweet man, 
really a brilliant mind, legal mind, and uh, it was super fun to cover that. And I have very fond memories of covering the Michael Jackson trial because we were up there for five or six months. Yeah. And, you know, and Bob Mass was one of those guys that would go out to dinner with us every night and he didn't drink and he eats really or ate nothing but oatmeal and chicken and stuff. Very funny, very sweet guy. And so when you bring up Michael Jackson, you think, oh, it just I, it makes me miss him. His funeral is this is uh, this Thursday. Sorry, sorry, yeah, that's and, tough. And uh, yeah, he passed away. He had uh, prostate cancer. Wow. And I, you know, just it's it heartbreaking. Yeah. But but yeah, you, the Michael Jackson. We were there for for six months. It was a different trending news story cycle back then. Mm -hmm. You know, Scott Peterson. Remember the Scott I Peterson do. case? I do. Yes, sure. That was the biggest news story of the year then. I'm not sure. That if was it Florida, happened today. right? was in California. Oh, that was ca California. California. Scott Peterson killed his wife, That's Lacey, right. and their unborn That's right. child. That's right. I'm sorry. That's right. And he had the, the he was having that affair with, with the, uh, the woman. Mm -hmm. and we were up there, the same thing. We were up in Northern California covering that for six months. Wow. And people were, it was kind of, it was the first time since OJ that people were mesmerized by court cases, right? By legal cases. And now, they don't resonate so much. the same way. Yeah. And some do and some don't. Casey Anthony kind of did, you know. People right. looked at it and kind of resonated and stuff. But Michael Jackson and Scott Peterson, two court cases that people were just riveted by. And we've tried a couple more. Like, this is going to be a big case. And, you know, we did, uh, who was the guy who played, who played uh, Beretta? What was it? Robert Blake, mm. who was accused of killing his? Yes. Yeah. Right. I mean, we did the trial and people were like, mm, yeah, just, you know. It's fine, but we're not really. Definitely not Michael Jackson. Didn't rate. Right. It wasn't a big deal. And you thought, okay, some are hit, some are misses, and that's just kind of the way it is. Trace, what's your daily life like now? Like, are you, are you a morning guy? Do you get up and, and do you do any mindset things? Do you do, you do any uh, special um, diet or, or exercise regimen? Yeah, I mean, we do. Uh, I live in Manhattan Beach, so it gives me a chance. I like, well, I surf. You know, I try to go you out do. and surf. Yeah, Good. surf a little bit. I play tennis with my wife couple times a week um, you know I try to work out a little bit here and there um, but yeah I mean I try to do something every day just to do just to get some exercise I go in now at about 11 o'clock because I do Shepherd show and then I do Martha's show and I'm responsible for I'm responsible for about four shows it's a lot but sometimes I'm in six depending on what the news is sometimes I'm in eight you know sometimes you're in every hour okay if there's breaking news mm-hmm and we handle a lot of the breaking news out of Los Angeles because, quite frankly, you know, look, when it's 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock here, it's 9 o'clock in New York, everybody in New York's gone. I mean, except for the anchors, the late night stuff, they're all gone. We still have a full crew in L.A. So we handle any breaking news that happens past, you know, 5 o'clock your time, 6 o'clock your time in the east yeah. is handled mostly by Los Angeles. Right. So we handle a lot of breaking news. Yeah. So, you know, it's one of those things where my job is, I'm, I have to read. I read everything about everything and anything. You know, I'm kind of the de facto aviation correspondent. I used to fly small planes and, uh, in Boise, Idaho. Nice. I didn't have any money. I didn't have any money to eat. And I was, <laughs> but you're flying but I planes. Was, but I, yeah, I was <laughs> getting pilot's license, pilots, um, you know, getting flying lessons. And I thought, you know, well, why not? It's that like daredevil in you. 120 bucks an hour at that time. Wow. I'm thinking 120 bucks is a lot. But it was it was your amazing. outlet. I'm sure it was amazing. Yeah. So yeah. so I you know I, I consider myself which I'm not really but I consider myself oh I'm the aviation expert but I've learned a lot over the years by covering these stories you know and researching these sure. things I've learned a lot about aviation so I can you know I can I can speak a yep. lot about some aviation topics and, and know what I'm talking about that's good but but yeah you know I try to read a lot computer where are you reading iPad or iPad yeah, I have an iPad and I read, you know, you go through all the, all the websites, the New York Times, and, you know, all mm -hmm. of them, Wall Street Journal, every morning you go through and see how they're covering things, see the headlines, see the slants, see the, you know, if it's fair, if it's different facts. And because you have no idea what's going to happen. You have no idea what's going to happen and then they say, okay, you got to get on TV. And so you have to have some knowledge to draw on. Sure. So I do a lot of that. Do you ever have time to wind down or yeah. are you always thinking? Uh, no, no, we, you know, I, I, at night, are you winding down to 10, 11 o'clock? Yeah. I get home around nine, nine fifteen at night. It's kind of, you know, this new schedule is, is not great because my, you know, I have girls, one's 18 and one's 14. And you know, by nine o'clock, nine thirty, school nights, sure. everybody's in bed yeah. or very close to being in bed. 
So, so you may miss them before you see them in the morning. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, you have time to say hi, have a day, and then they're going to bed. Yeah. So it's kind of a kind of a bummer, but we spend a lot of time together on the weekend, and um, you know, it's it's been good. Yeah, I wind. I mean, you know, we get a couple of good glasses of Brunello, and <laughs> that's right, Brunello Montalcino. You get a good <laughs> Brunello, it. and I'm I'm totally happy. <laughs> oh, totally that's great. Happy. That's I awesome. read a lot. I read a lot of books, you know, and so. Tell you us. Know, can you tell us one? Uh, I am. Uh, I just finished. I just finished um, Where the Crawdads Sing. Have you read this book? No. It's a fantastic book. Really a Fiction? fantastic book. Fiction? It was, it was written by a travel writer. It's a, it's a novel. Okay. And it's, um, it's just about this girl whose family abandons her. And she lives in the, I guess she's in the Carolinas somewhere. Family abandons her. And, and it goes through how she kind of survived. Interesting. It's a really good book. It's like number one or number two in them, but it's a fantastic book. Great. Really well done. So, you know, you kind of, when I was riding the train in New York, I was taking the train every day, you know, back before iPads, right? This is uh, 10, 12 years ago. And you'd read, you know, you'd burn through sure. two books a week. Sure. So you're just reading everything. And good change of pace, too, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. You know, you read all kinds of good stuff. You read everything, every nonfiction book that comes out. And then you read some fiction in there, and you yeah. think just you know, it was it was super fun. That's great. Yeah, super fun. Trace, if you were to pick, take your cell phone out right now and call the twenty-year-old Trace, any advice you'd give him? Um, you know, I'll tell you, Roger. The the thing that I and a friend of mine just asked me this. He said, "Would you go into? Would you do television again? Would you go into it?" You know, my career has turned out. You know, I think it's turned out very well. It's everything I expected. It really has been fascinating just for me to do the stuff that I've done, to meet the people that I, that I meet, and you know, to just have traveled and lived in all these places, you think it's just been s just superb, really exceptional. Would you do it again? If you had, knowing what you'd have to go through, would you do it again? It's a tough question, because you know, the, the Yuma, Arizona days, the days when you don't have any money, and you're working, 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 and you're traveling, and you're traveling, you think, man, that's a grind. So, I don't know, I think, I think I would tell the 20-year-old Trace to, um, you know, take a hard look at, at what you want to do in life because whatever you choose to do to be good at it is going to be hard. It's difficult. It is difficult to, to get a career and to become good. It takes, it takes hours, months, years yeah. to really, you know, get good at your craft. And don't you think back to those days when you were announcing the fashion shows right. and really it, it sounds to me like that's where you really, you, you, you found your, your passion, you found your purpose and it was your, you know, that was your trajectory that you, that you just took off and you, you yeah. embraced it. That's yeah. what I love is that, you know, that's why I really wanted to sit down with you, hear your story and I didn't know any of that. So it's nice to hear those early days yeah. got you to where you are today. But you're right, you have to, you have to really think about, you know, I talked to my son all the time um, what, and my daughter right you, you really have to think about what you want to do you got to think about it and you you know you want to you know you want the it's don't go into television because you want to be on television it's it's you know it's very tough it's a very tough thing to do because it's competitive a lot of people want to be on television yeah. you know you need to be good at it you need to be very good you need to be very fair and it takes a lot of years to really know you know, to really speak, I tell, I tell these young girls that want to be TV news anchors at 22, and I say, you know what, don't, don't be a news anchor at 22. Be a reporter. Go out and be a reporter. Nobody believes what you're saying until you're 30 or 35 years anyway. old. Anyway. Yeah, good advice. So go out, report for 10 years, yeah. and then somebody's going to hire you as a news anchor, and you're going to know what you're talking about, and you're going to have a very long run. They hire you as a news anchor at 24, you're going to last two years, and you're out. Yeah. So. You know, make your bones. Go out, make your bones, learn about what you're talking about. Get a job in a capital city like Boise, Idaho, where you learn about political issues right there. You're in the state house, you learn about it. It's a small market, and yet it's a big experience to be able to kind of process that kind of stuff. That's what makes you a good reporter. Go out, cover the hurricanes, right? Cover the hurricanes, find out how people are surviving, find out how people are, you know, are, are doing a year later. Go back and just see what their year was like. You know, not just two days. Go back 20 years later. What happened to the kids in Columbine? What, how did they teach their kids? Where did they put their kids in school? You know, what did they do differently that they wouldn't have done had they just had a normal high school experience? So, you know, that's what gives you perspective. It's all about context and perspective. 
you know, we preach this. I tell everybody, you've got to have context and perspective to really be a good news anchor, to be a good reporter. You just need to know what you're talking about and you need to have some experience. You know, you can't, you got to get your hands dirty in some of that stuff. It's the, it's the only way you can do it. Great I mean, advice. I don't, I don't believe anybody who's, you know, any 22 year olds coming out tonight. Yeah. I tell you, nobody believes you. Nobody believes you. Go out, learn. No, it's great advice because it's, it's, it's true. I it's mean, true. that's reality. That's reality. I told my daughter. I said, yeah, do, go. Go. I said, you know, if it was up to me, go to college, get a law degree because you can do whatever you want. I'm not saying you have to be a lawyer, but whatever you go into after that, you go in, everybody looks at you like, oh, you've got a law degree. Oh, okay. Yep. So, you know, you're kind of a, you're kind of a badass. Sure. For the sake of a better word. Sure. Apologies about that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You just, you, you go with a little bit more gravitas, and, and that's what I, I tell my daughters. I say, people look at you differently. Maybe it's not fair, but it's the truth. When you come out and you've got a master's or a, a law degree. Absolutely. They just look at you like, oh. Well, you put that work in, those extra years of, of study. Mm -hmm. to have, That's experience in, itsel in right. itself. Exactly. Good job. Well, Trace Gallagher, you are a gentleman. It's been wonderful to, to been sit down with you today. I do have one last question, What's and that, that is, what do you want your legacy to be? Mm, my legacy, I want, I want uh, the world to say, man, that guy told his daughters, gave them good advice. He gave good advice because they have, they have become very successful women. That's the whole thing. For me, you know, my legacy is it, nobody's ever going to bring me on the late night shows. You know, I'm just not, I'm not that guy. Totally fine with me. But, but someday somebody might bring my daughter on a late night show. You know, because they are, you know, they're doing really well. They've become good kids. And so your legacy is, how did your kids turn out? Your kids turn out to be good. You know, you look at your son, you think, you know, that's what it's all about. If your kids turn out to be strong women and, and they are respected and live good lives, people are going to we can talk about Trace Gallagher's life for 100 years on that son of a gun. That, the guy on Fox News Channel, oh, I hated that guy or I liked that guy. But then they, you know, that guy, that guy turned out a good family man. He, you know, he, he and his wife did a good job. At the end of the day, people. that's what matters. That's what matters. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what, you know, someone told me and I said, you know, I used to, oh my God, Peter Jennings is, I was, you know, I was a big fan of Peter Jennings because I still think he was probably the greatest broadcaster ever. And they would say, yep, you know, it's, it's sad, but when Peter Jennings died, people are like, you know, it's so sad. And then they move on. Yeah. So the truth is people, you know, people are great. But nobody cares. Nobody cares that, that you were Peter Jennings or Trace Gallagher or you know, Roger Brooks. Nobody, you know, they just, your friends and your family and those who love you care about you. Nobody else does. That's it. Awesome. Because they have their own lives and they shouldn't. They have their own lives and their own families to care yeah. about. So. That core, that central core, that's what matters. Sure. That's what matters. Trace, thanks so much. Welcome to the American Real family and, and thanks so much for doing this. Very good. You tell Glennie I said hello. I will. Thanks. Yep. Thanks for tuning in to American Real. Be sure to visit our website, AmericanReal.tv, or search for us on iTunes or YouTube for past episodes. While you're there, please rate us or leave us a review, as that helps others find our show. I am truly grateful and appreciate all of your support. At American Real, we're on a mission to help as many people around the world fulfill their dreams and obtain their goals. If you'd like to be part of our inner circle or want one-on-one -on -one coaching, Check out the American Real Learning Academy, where we have self-help groups and courses so you can build the best you. We also have a new Facebook group where you can connect with high achievers from around the world. If you want to go even further, maybe you're determined to write your own book or launch your own podcast, contact me today to see if we could help. You can reach me through Instagram or Facebook or email me directly at roger at americanreal.tv. And speaking of podcasting, our next course will be starting soon. So if you're interested in launching your own podcast, join me and podcast your passion. I'll take you through my eight-week course where I'll mentor you to build a world-class podcast. I'm only taking on a small group of people who want to share their passion through broadcasting, where I'll have you up on iTunes and YouTube within weeks so you can podcast your passion. Click on the link below for more information. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week.